Hello, I'm Simon Whistler, you're watching Top Tens Net, and in the video today, we're looking at the top 10 most horrifying facts about samurai warfare. On this video, we had the pleasure of working with a leading samurai expert, Anthony Cummings. Anthony is actually the author of a book, it's called The Book of Samurai, which as you can see by this physical copy right here, he was kind enough to send me. It is a translation of a samurai school curriculum, and it's both interesting and informative at the same time. There is a link to this book in the description below, and if you like this video, you're really going to enjoy this book. I'll have a little bit more information after the list, so do stay tuned. Number 10. The primary aim of the samurai on the field of battle was head collecting. One of the lesser highlighted facts about the samurai is that they were primarily a head cult. Their warrior culture focused on the capture, collection, identification, and displaying of decapitated human heads. Their society was based on the accruement of agricultural land or the financial gain from controlling land. In return for captured enemy heads, a general would dole out new portions of wealth to his men. The higher the status of the enemy head or the level of achievement needed to obtain it, the greater the rewards would be. A Japanese battle may see champions leaving the field with bags known as kubibu kuru, which were net or cloth sacks that held the heads they had taken. Also, a samurai on horseback may have heads tied to cords which hung from the rings of the saddle. Number 9. Providing proof that an enemy head had not been falsified with a reward system based on decapitated heads, it became apparent that some samurai of lesser scruples would try to cheat the system and use lesser heads as higher-ranking ones for financial gain and prestige. To combat this, the samurai had certain ways of identification. If there was another trustworthy samurai to vouch for the kill, his word could be taken. Alternatively, a samurai would need to bring back one of the neckplates of a samurai helmet or even his sword, which would show that it was taken from a warrior. If bringing in a general's head, a samurai would need to have his war baton, which was used to command troops, otherwise the kill of such a high-priority target could not be confirmed. Furthermore, some samurai were thought to have killed women and monks and presented their heads for reward. Therefore, if a head was deemed suspicious in any way, it was known as an honor kubi, a female head or a yamai kubi, an improper head. If a head was confirmed as reliable, then it was recorded in the Kubicho, the Book of Heads. Number 8. The displaying of decapitated heads and cries of war If in a skirmish a new head had been taken, the victor was to lift it up with his left hand and let forth a mighty battle cry to which any allies in the vicinity would lift any heads they had captured and join in with the cry. Heads would be then taken off the battlefield by the samurai or even their servants. However, even at this point, a samurai had to be careful. Other servants or even samurai would snatch heads from people who were not concentrating. To help prevent this, the samurai would place a cord through the mouth of the head and out of the throat and wear it like a handbag to keep it safe, or as said before, keep it in a headbag. After the battle, a ceremony known as Jiken, the head inspection, was conducted. This involved the picking of good enemy heads to be presented to the lord, where he would be seated in armor with spellcasters and bowmen to defend him from evil spirits, or he would be on horseback, where he moved along the lines of gibbeted heads. Heads of high-ranking warriors would be placed in a box with Buddhist spells upon it and wrapped in a cloak with an arrow pushed through the top where the cloth ties, at which point it would be sent back to the enemy in respect. Number 7. Samurai would create oaths of bonding before going to war The word of the samurai was stronger than iron, according to the documents we are using today, and such an oath was truly binding. Samurai used different types of oath. This could be kapan, the blood oath, with which a promise was given to the gods and sealed in blood, or it could be the shichimai gisho, the seventh sheet oath, where a promise is given seven times on seven sheets of paper to different gods. However, not all samurai were honest. Samurai would get themselves into small groups and make pledges that if any of them fled and left the battle, then their houses, property, wives, and children would belong to the rest of the group. This was done to ensure bravery. The samurai then made their servants swear oaths, saying that if they served them well, they would reward them, but if they were to abandon them in battle, then they would be hunted across all of Japan and their entire family line would be put to death for their crimes. It is unknown how much of a reality this is, but records show that such promises were put in place. Number 6. Samurai prayed to the gods of war for victory, and some wore the costume of death. Samurai prayed to gods such as Hachiman and Marashiten. Before war, samurai would roll their flags up and prepare themselves at a holy place dedicated to Hachiman, because the ideograms used for flag and Hachiman have a connection. The samurai believed in a host of war gods, and some believed that the hole in the top of a samurai's helmet was installed so that the 98,000 gods of war could enter them, allowing them to be godlike in battle. In truth, the hole is a vent to allow air to escape, but some samurai did believe this. If an army was scattered, they would take a flag called the Dragon Banner to a height on a hill so that the army could regroup. They thought that the gods of war rested in high places and that the spirit of war would pull the men back together. However, some samurai said it was simply easier to see the banner at a height. 
Also, any samurai who wanted to die in the upcoming battle would wear the costume of death. This meant that they would cut the ends of any cords of their armor, such as the helmet or arrow cape, as it signified that they could not retie them, meaning that they are not going to prepare for battle again and that they would either be victorious in battle or be left dead on the field. Number 5. Bellicose language was the order of the day. For a samurai, even language had to correctly represent a warrior attitude, as they could be frowned at or questioned if they used the wrong verbs to describe different actions in war. This point is based in subtle plays in the Japanese language, and as we're talking in English, they're not evident. But for us, it is similar to the feeling of screaming, FLEE FOR YOUR LIVES! and let's make a tactical withdrawal. Thus, a samurai should loosen his bowstring, but never say remove. He should never fold a flag, but roll it away. Samurai never cut down bamboo to make poles for war banners, they hunt bamboo for war banners. There are many examples of this, but they are steeped in an understanding of Japanese. But to encapsulate the idea, remember that a samurai is never killed in battle, he simply achieved death. To say otherwise would be a disgrace to his memory. Number 4. If a new sword is given on a campaign of war, it must be bathed in blood. This one shows one of the conundrums of being a samurai leader. Many know the rumor that a Japanese katana must taste blood if it is drawn, but this is a simplification of the historical reality, as there are many instances where a samurai sword is drawn but does not take blood. Ancient scrolls tell us that when a leader of a troop or captain has done well, he may be rewarded with a new sword by the general or lord, but that puts him in a tight spot. It is a rule that samurai leaders do not enter into combat unless the battle has gone wrong and that the task of the leader is to lead and direct his men, but it is also a tradition that when a new sword is given in war, it must be bathed in the blood of enemy kills, a baptism of blood if you will. So for a leader to accept this sword, he must either forsake the correct way of the captain or step down from his position so he can take the sword into battle. To get around this, the samurai could either decline the new sword or ask that it be entrusted to the lord's squire until the end of the campaign. Number 3. Skinning a Human Face As we learned before, samurai culture is based on head-taking and is possibly one of the largest head cults in history. But what happens when there are just too many heads to take? If the amount of heads is too many for the samurai and servants to carry, a samurai can ask permission of his captain to engage in the activity of Hana o Kaku, cutting off enemy noses. A samurai could use a nose instead of a head to show that he had achieved victory in battle, and these are much easier to carry as they are placed between the chest and the breastplate. But remember, a samurai needs to prove that this is not an improper head. To do this, there are two main ways. If the nose is cut from the bridge, then the cut must go down and around the mouth and back up to the bridge of the nose, then the lower part of the face is peeled off. The reason for this is that samurai would often wear a moustache or have stubble and thus prove that it was at least a male head. If the nose was cut from the base of the nostrils, then the cut had to go up and over the eyebrows, and then the skin was peeled off. This is because women shape their eyebrows differently to men, and again the sex of the head could be identified. To this day, there is a shrine in Kyoto, Japan, where tens of thousands of noses taken during the Japanese invasion of Korea in the 16th century are buried. However, many of these are civilian because Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the leader of the invasion and Japan, ordered that everyone, men, women, and children, should be killed. Number 2. Taking the head of your friends while under fire As we have seen, taking an enemy head was of extreme importance, but it was also important not to allow your own head or a friend's head to fall into enemy hands. Therefore, if a samurai force was losing a battle or skirmish, brave people would engage in an action known as Shingari to defend the retreat. These people helped injured comrades while under enemy fire or would decapitate their already dead allies who lay on the ground. However, to ensure that the samurai was not accused of foul play and for killing his own allies, they would try to have a servant do the task. However, if the warrior was famous for his loyalty and bravery, his word would not be questioned, and it was okay for him to take the allied head. That being said, a samurai could not guarantee that his head would not end up on an enemy spike, so samurai perfumed their heads to make sure their decapitated heads were well presented. Also, if allied heads were brought back or for those fallen in a siege, then their teeth may be stained black to elevate their social rank in death. Number 1. Samurai did not fight fairly The idea of a samurai as an enlightened warrior who was chivalric and noble is a half-myth with some elements of truth. The common thought that a samurai would declare his name on the battlefields and find an equal in rank, who would then pair off in a fair fight, is a leftover from ancient times in the earlier parts of samurai history. By the 16th century, the first person to clash on a battlefield was called the Ichiban Yari. The first spear ran that person should exclaim their name to the opponent. But after this, the armies entered into general melee. Samurai would have two types of people with them when at war, a form of a man-at-arms who may assist them in combat, and also servants who were preferred not to join in the fight but who would help remove their master's gear from the field of battle. 
However, this means that those men that help in combat may often shoot, stab, or slash the enemy from the side and make it two-on-one combat or even a two-on-two situation. There is also the case of the action of the old hawk teaching the young hawk, where an elder, father, or uncle was to take a young samurai into battle, help him kill a target, and then return with the head. But the best of all is the promise between samurai to form death squads. This is where one warrior would face the enemy, another warrior would defend the area from people trying to interfere, and the last warrior would come up on the enemy from behind and cut his throat, and if the group did this multiple times, the entire team would gain a head not so chivalric after all. So I really hope you enjoyed that video that we put together with Anthony Cummings, the author of this book. Now, as I said at the beginning of the video, I was gonna tell you a little bit more about it. This book has been sitting on my, by the way, this isn't a paid promotion or anything. We just had the pleasure of working with Anthony for this list and I did wanna talk about his book. It's been sitting on my desk for like two weeks and I've been browsing through it. It's a seriously big book. And basically I kind of thought there's stuff in here that is relevant and entertaining at the same time. So, I mean, in this section on miscellaneous articles, there's uh, a little section about how samurais must refrain from telling lies, and then there's also kind of more entertaining ones, which I suppose could be useful as well. This one, for example, on page 57 is dealing with a violent drinker's rudeness. So the samurai had a lot of guides for a lot of different things. Again, it's the book of Samurai, loads of stuff in here. Also, if you don't wanna buy the book, below there is another link which goes to a free overview of the book that Anthony has put together. So we wanna thank Anthony for working together with us on this video. Go check out his book and thank you for watching.